Today in the 21st uh, century, at least in the beginning part, we are faced with an urgent planetary grand challenge, which is food. More specifically, we are faced with an urgent demand for both increased and sustainable food production. There's a number of factors for this. One is our global population, which currently stands at about 7.6 billion, will go up to about 9.5 billion by 2050. That would be equivalent to adding another China and another India to our planet um, in terms of population. Now, that is a lot of people to, uh, to feed. Um, and as you know, food is not produced out of nothing, but uh, we need essential resources, such as water, nutrients, arable land, and energy to produce food. Now, this uh, crucial truth may be obvious to many of you, but actually this became all the more clear to me when I conducted my postdoctoral fellowship at NASA Kennedy Space Center in the 1990s um, in a division of NASA called Controlled Ecological Life Support System. It's NASA's division for space farming. So at NASA, I worked with colleagues um, and helped develop uh, strategies for uh, producing food in the extraterrestrial environment of, say, the lunar surface or Mars. And of course, in space, there's not a readily accessible or available uh, source of resources, arable land, energy, nutrients. And so back on planet Earth, our situation here in terms of the environment, you could say, is friendlier. But the uh, reality of the increasingly scarce resources that we have for food production is very real. So for instance, food production today is already responsible for almost 70% of all fresh water withdrawals worldwide. Food production already uses about half of the land area of the Earth. And food production and its supply chain consumes already 30% of all energy expenditures. So with this scenario, how do we increase our food production uh, to meet the growing demand by 2050 with all of these scarce resources? The United Nations, by the way, made projections that <clears throat> to meet this demand, our food production has to increase by 70% by the middle of the century, and crop production has to double by that time. So this really is a tall order, and we need all the help that uh, we need uh, to be able to meet this grand challenge. And we need our collective intelligence to come up with the innovative solutions that are necessary to meet this challenge. But what is becoming clear is that we need to include in here another form of human-created intelligence um, to be able to address these challenges, and that is machine learning intelligence, or what we commonly refer to as artificial intelligence, or AI. But what is intelligence anyway? So Max Stegmark, who is a professor of physics at MIT, defines intelligence as a certain form of information processing uh, that is performed by elementary particles that are moving around. So that definition may be oversimplified, and in fact, it may be um, puzzling to some of you, but actually, it is right on target because our native human intelligence is carbon-based, and it is physiologically enabled by our biological brain, which is made up of neurons or brain cells, <clears throat> within which these elementary particles are moving around to perform uh, information processing. So within this process, uh, the brain cells receive data and information from the outside world in the form of input signals. The brain cells then parse the data, they learn from the data, and then make they make inferences and projections and predictions about the outside world uh, through this data. Now, as wonderful and miraculous our human brain is, it is actually um, quite limited. And so we have to summon our carbon humility. For instance, um, the storage capacity of our brain for memory is quite finite, and also the, uh, the speed uh, with which uh, we process information is also quite slow. <laughs> so we need carbon humility. Carbon humility is a recognition of the limitation of our carbon-based intelligence. It's also a recognition that we need to augment our carbon-based intelligence with another form of human-built and human-created intelligence that is silicon-based and maybe in the future photon-based that will amplify 
and that will make more powerful, turbocharged, if you will, our current uh, human intelligence. Now, this is machine learning intelligence. This is artificial intelligence. Now, I want to point out that uh, there is a distinguishing characteristic uh, with artificial intelligence uh, that makes it distinct from our native human intelligence. Apart from the speed, astonishing speed with which it processes information and ret retrieves data, uh, for instance, we, with our native human intelligence, we make decisions by appealing to certain perceived certainties, such as uh, natural laws, ethical principles, legal principles, as well as cause and effect relationships. But in the case of artificial intelligence, the way they arrive at decisions is they go through all the data that they have access to, and then they make mathematical correlations and statistical probabilities. So that is how they arrive at decisions. And this is why um, scientists are insistent in the fact that uh, whatever decisions artificial, artificial intelligence arrives at must remain under the oversight of those with native human intelligence, of course, to which I agree. But nonetheless, um, artificial intelligence opens up to us a whole new realm, a whole new vista for seeing things and analyzing things, and therefore of making decisions and designing creative solutions to address challenges, including that for food. For instance, um, when machine learning algorithm considers the digital image of an apple, it actually, through data correlations and inferences, make important decisions concerning that apple. It can determine and decide what the moisture content of that apple is, what its uh, sugar content is, what its relative uh, desirability to a certain segment of consumers is, what is its projected um, shelf life. And not only that, it can make decisions on the total amount of water, the total amount of nutrients, and the total amount of energy that would be needed to produce just such an apple. So not many may realize this yet, but certain forms of AI are actually already being applied in food production today, uh, even in open field cultivation. Today, it's customary for satellites and even drones to be deployed for them to take uh, spectral measurements of plant canopies uh, through which it can measure uh, the nutrient status, the irrigation status, even the disease and pest status of crops. And by then, they can make uh, and they can design management strategies which can be precisely implemented in the farm, not only in the open field, but even in closed environment systems. So one notable achievement of NASA's biologically based space life support system is that it was able to successfully grow crops in closed chambers, wherein the temperature, relative humidity, uh, nutrient solution, uh, even the level of CO2 in the ambient atmosphere could be regulated so that you could really maximize and optimize crop productivity per unit resource use. So today, uh, this has a corresponding spin-off here on Earth uh, for commercial applications, which is plant factory, commonly now referred to as vertical farms. So for instance, this is uh, the vertical farm facility of the company Spread based in Tokyo, Japan. This is really just the expanded version of NASA's biologically based space life support system. Uh, this is a vertical farming uh, teaching facility right here at the U of A uh, at the Controlled Ecological Life Support Systems. This is a vertical farming facility of iBioTherapeutic, which is based in College Station, Texas. Today, vertical farms are emerging worldwide, not only because of, again, their maximum uh, and consistent productivity, but also because of their sustainability achievements. For instance, um, they're able to save water by 80 to 90 percent compared with open field cultivation. If you're using solar constant, solar photovoltaics, you also will be able to save significantly on electricity using renewable energy. Since my residency at NASA Kennedy, and since I've been here at the University of Arizona, I've been developing innovative technologies relating to uh, food production. And today, every one of these technologies is well poised to be recalibrated by, by AI for maximum performance per unit resource use. One is this NASA-supported project on hybrid solar and electric lighting systems. So where you're combining renewable energy with electrical energy from light-emitting diodes and other efficient light sources to produce crops. 
A spin-off of this is composite lighting, which is a strategy whereby with a given amount of energy, you can really jack up the productivity of the crop. Or conversely, if you want to achieve a certain productivity of crop, you can use less amount of energy. Today, there's a lighting company in California that's testing this strategy for incorporation into its lighting uh, strategy. Another one is aquaponics, which is the hybrid between fish culture and crop production, and whereby nutrients from the fish is channeled to the crops, and the crops in turn help uh, treat the water which goes back to the fish. So our group has uh, determined uh, the proper density of the fish culture that would correspond to any size of hydroponic systems. Our group is also pioneering this uh, strategy or approach for vertical farming, which is known as the minimalist structured modular and prefabricated vertical farm, um, of which a shipping container is an example of a modular unit. And uh, we have designed this original and patented um, uh, growing system, which we refer to as the Beehive Green Box, whereby we can really maximize productivity in the given volume of the modular unit, be it a shipping container or a giant uh, warehouse type of uh, production system. Our group is also um, designing original designs for bioreactors and photobioreactors for growing algae cells, for growing uh, plant cells, microbial cells and other type of cells for food and other high value products. So we now have about a total of about seven original bioreactor designs. And again, this is bringing bioreactor design into the fourth industrial revolution of the 21st century, melding the physical with the digital and the biological. So with all of these exciting innovations, and of course not just from the ones that we're doing in my lab, but from many, many others around the world, uh, the age for AI complete, uh, which now coincides with the advent of the fourth industrial revolution, is almost here and now. Uh, not only to be able to monitor and to sense and to make measurements of the critical environmental parameters in a growing system, um, and also do optimization and regulation and control so that you can maximize production per unit resource use, but it's also anticipated to implement and execute certain management uh, activities and tasks so that, again, you have an AI-complete uh, production system. Food will be produced in a revolutionary manner pretty soon. And just some closing thoughts here. AI will enable food production to be achieved anywhere and at any time on Earth and in extraterrestrial worlds. Um, AI will make it possible to produce food independently of the geography, of the climate, and of the time of the year. AI will help realize Coelho's law. So you may be wondering what it is. It's crop productivity per unit resource use in a tech-dense vertical farms should double every four to five years. I'm working with the Association for Vertical Farming, which is the world's uh, premier organization in vertical farming. And we're working with different vertical farming companies around the world for them to self-report their sustainability achievements so that over the years, we will be able to monitor their progress and hopefully it will conform to uh, Coelho's law. AI will dramatically reconfigure agricultural education. AI will break down the artificial separation between science and engineering, and it will meld um, biology with the physical and with the um, digital, which again is the essence of the fourth industrial revolution. And lastly, we have to recognize that AI has real potential to increase the divide between the AI haves and the AI have-nots in food among nations. AI is wonderful. However, it requires uh, capacity building in terms of knowledge, in terms of expertise, in terms of hardware, in terms of infrastructure. And these are things that not all nations on Earth today possess. So it is for this reason that I am sounding a clarion call tonight um, to NGOs, to uh, foundations such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, to um, tech companies and universities, to the World Economic Forum, and to the world governments led by the United States and China, the European Union, Japan, Russia, to join forces with all the other nations uh, to establish this global Marshall Plan for AI-based uh, production uh, of food. 
And I am also issuing this call to you tonight for those of you who are here and those who will be watching this video. Go to social media, talk to your government leaders and representatives to help establish this uh, global Marshall Plan. We have to make sure that AI will be used to produce food sustainably, not just for a few, not just for some, but for all of us on the planet. Thank you.